chapter 3. Thank you. God bless you in the name of Jesus Christ. This is April the 30th, last day of April 2023. We are in Otis Orchards, Washington, and this is Steve Armstrong. We're going to look today at spoil. Believe it or not, Exodus chapter 3. And our first verse we're going to look at today is in Exodus chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 19. Uh, and it'll make sense as we go along here. That's a, a funny title, but it'll make sense. We're not talking about cabbages necessarily. Verse 19, context. Uh, Moses is sent to deliver Israel. And yeah, he's out. Moses is still in the desert. God is for introducing himself to Moses through the burning bush and convincing Moses that he, he's got to go back to Egypt and get the people out of there. Uh, that famous verse 14, God said unto Moses, I am that I am. I will be what I will be. Or uh, Jehovah, or as the Rastafarians say, Yah. That's where he gets his name. But he comes down to verse 19. God is saying, and I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. No, not by a mighty hand. <clears throat> and I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof. And after that, he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it shall come to pass that when you go, you shall not go empty. Verse 22, but every woman shall borrow. And some texts say, ask of her neighbor and of her that sojourns in her house, jewels of silver, jewels of gold and raiment. And you shall put them upon your sons and upon your daughters, and you shall what? Spoil the Egyptians. From this little verse here, when Israel left Egypt, they took all the gold and the silver and the jewels with them. A lot of times when the Bible says jewels, it's talking about gold and silver, not necessarily diamonds and rubies. But they took all the wealth of Egypt with them. And the Egyptians were glad to give it to them to be rid of them because they'd just gone through 10 or so plagues. But the spoil that they took, it was all the good stuff, all the portable stuff, wealth stuff that the Egyptians had. And here the word calls it spoil. Now, I looked up in the Hebrew. The word spoil has 14 different definitions. So there is one that says, you know, spoil your cabbage. And there is one that says, spoil your fun. <coughs> but this obviously is none of that. This is talking about stuff. So they took stuff from the Egyptians and the, the Bible calls it spoil. Uh, one of the definitions for spoil is to take away or to snatch away, to strip off, to spoil anyone with, especially to spoil someone with power and courage. That's one of them. Uh, one of the definitions. And in some cases there is, when an army was defeated, they spoiled them. They took their stuff after they defeated the army. This one, the people freely gave of all their stuff to the Israelites when they left and they spoiled them. So of all the 14 definitions in Wilson's Old Testament word studies, uh, I have my own. It's called the stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Numbers chapter 31. There are several records of, uh, of where armies conquered an army and they took their stuff. Uh, here is verse Numbers 31. This is talking about the Midians. Let's Midianites. We'll start in verse 6. Moses ordered to go get the Midianites. God ordered him to go get the Midianites. Verse 6. And Moses sent them to the war, a thousand of every tribe, uh, them and Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the priest, to the war with the holy instruments and the trumpets to blow in his hand. And they warred against the Midianites, as the Lord commanded Moses, and they slew all the males. Verse 8, and they slew the kings of Midian beside the rest of them that were slain, namely Evi and Rechem and Zur and Hur and Reba, five kings of Midian. Balaam also, the son of Beor, they slew with the sword. There's the end of Balaam and the, the talking ass man. 
And the children of Israel took all the women of Midian captives and their little ones and took the spoil of all their cattle and all their flocks and all their goods. There's a big war. They defeated five kings. And what did they do? They took the ladies and their kids and they took cattle and stuff. That was the spoil. So it was all good stuff. And they took it all because they won. Deuteronomy chapter 20. Going through just some selected verses here. Deuteronomy 20. This is another. Who are we fighting against here? Somebody. Um, it's just generally fighting wars. But we'll look at verse 14. Well, 13, just to get a running start. When the Lord thy God hath delivered it into thine hands, thou shalt smite every male thereof with the edge of the sword. But the women and the little ones and the cattle and all that is in the city, even all the spoil thereof, shalt thou take unto thyself. And thou shalt eat the spoil of thine enemies, which the Lord thy God has given thee. So here is they captured these cities and the, the, the males, the fighter men, they got killed. The ladies and the children were taken and the stuff here. Some of the stuff was edibles, some of the food that they had. So they took that, took that to be their own too. Judges chapter eight. Judges chapter eight. Here in the time of uh, Gideon. Judges chapter eight. Gideon, you remember, was a hiding in the in the wine press, threshing his wheat. God said, you mighty man of valor, you're going to deliver the people. And he did. And it was a fantastic delivery with the trumpets and the pitchers with fire in them and all that. You remember that. But Judges chapter 8, let's start in 22. Judges 8, 22. Then the men of Israel said unto Gideon, rule thou over us both thou and thy sons, and thy sons' sons also. For thou hast delivered us, delivered us from the hand of Midian. Uh, this is judges, remember. They, people did good for a couple generations, and then they did evil, and then they got overrun by Philistines or Midianites or whoever, and they cried unto God. God raised up a judge. So in this, this time, they were so thankful that he got the Midianites out of the way that they offered him the job of being a king for three generations. Let's see how, if Gideon was tempted about that. Verse 23. And Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. Amen. And Gideon said unto them, I would desire a request of you, that you would give me every man the earrings of his prey. For they had golden earrings, because they were Ishmaelites. And they answered, we will willingly give them. And they spread a garment and did cast therein every man the earrings of his prey, which was spoil. You know, they killed a guy, took his earrings. And the weight of the golden earrings that he requested was a thousand and seven hundred shekels of gold, besides ornaments and collars and purple raiment that was on the kings of Midian, and beside the chains that were about their camel's necks. I don't know if any of you are looking at a companion Bible, but these were Ishmaelites from the Far East. And on their camels and horses and donkeys, they had chains that hung on their chest areas and usually had the crescent star on there. Uh, there are other records in the Old Testament about that. So even their animals had gold on them. So as they beat the Midianites, they took all this stuff off, not only off of the soldiers and the the purple royal robes off the five kings or however many kings there were, but they had all this gold and stuff that was on their animals. So the pile of stuff here was very, very large. It kind of varies what they call a shekel back in the day, but it was heavy. And uh, he made an ephod out of it and did some stuff. But look at that. Here was the battle was won and look at all the stuff that they came. That was the spoils. Joshua chapter 22. I guess we got to go back a book. Joshua 22. Joshua 22. Uh, blah, 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 verse 7. Oh, okay. I remember this one. 
Joshua 22, 7. This is actually after most of the promised land was conquered. Most of the people were killed or run off. Verse 7, now to the one half of the tribe of Manasseh, Moses had given possession in Bashan. And unto the other half thereof gave Joshua among their brethren on this side, Jordan, westward. And when Joshua sent them away also unto their tents, then he blessed them. And he spake unto them, saying, Return with much riches unto your tents, and with very much cattle, and with silver, and with gold, and with brass, and with iron, and with very much raiment. Divide the spoil of your enemies with your brethren. There's a little backstory there. Moses, you know where the Jordan River comes north and south in, in the promised land? This side, I'm doing this for you, on this side is Jordan presently. But when they were coming in the promised land, Manasseh, and what was the other tribe? Somebody, somebody, asked Moses if they could stay on that side, stay on the east side, because it was a great place for herding cattle. Moses said, sure. So Manasseh kind of split both sides of the Jordan, and the other, Ephraim? Ephraim. Yeah, so they were on that side. And Moses said, sure, you can have that land as your inheritance, but if we ever go to battle, you got to come across and help everybody. And this is the result of it. They came across, they helped everybody, and now Joshua is saying, well, take all the spoil you earn, killing everybody in the promised land, and go to the place that Moses promised you. And it looked like they were pretty well off, right? They had a lot of, a lot of stuff. Now, 1 Samuel chapter 30. 1 Samuel chapter 30. <coughs> Samuel, what is the matter with my mouth today? This is a great record that I enjoy, and I'm sure you enjoy too. Talking about David, uh, David, he's, of course, not hiding, but he's keeping ahead of Saul. Uh, this is kind of after Saul went to the seance, yeah. So Saul's kind of on his way out if he's not dead already. But uh, David was doing some work for the Philistines, kind of like a mercenary guy. And in chapter 30 of 1 Samuel, David... <coughs> And his men had set up headquarters in a little town called Ziklag. And David and his men had been to battle uh, in the previous chapter. And they're coming home after the battle to Ziklag. Verse 1. And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire and taken the women captives that were therein and they slew not many either small or great but carried them away and went on their way got the picture david's out fighting so he comes home bad guys have raided his town and taken his women so david and his men came to the city and behold it was burned with fire and their wives their sons their daughters were taken captives then david and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep and david's two wives were taken Ahioam, the Jezreelite, and Abigail, <coughs> the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But, great line, David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. A lot of pressure on him. He was the, the boss of them, and <coughs> they were blaming him. People do that. Something goes wrong. They're looking for somebody to blame. But God, this is why God and David got along so good. Even in this pressure, David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. David said to Abiathar, the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abiathar brought hither the ephod to David. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, pursue for thou shalt surely overtake them and without fail recover all. You understand what an ephod was? There was no spirit of God on people. They couldn't get revelation. <clears throat> so they made these things. Some records, are, it's a little basket that the priest wore on his chest, and it was filled with white stones and black stones. And they'd ask a question, shall I pursue? White stone, yes. Am I going to be victorious? White stone, yes. That's what they, how they asked the God, asked of God. Isn't it better to have revelation today instead of all of us carrying little packets of stones on our yeah. chest? But anyway, that's what they had. 
And you can read about that. There, there's some a discrepancy about what it was, but that's basically what it did. Anyway, David encouraged himself in God. He went to God and said, what do we do? This is what God said. So David went. He and the 600 men that were with him and came to the brook Bezor, where those that were left behind stayed. <coughs> but David pursued. He and 400 men for 200 abode behind, which were so faint they could not go over the brook Bezor. How come they were so tired? They just came from a battle with these other dudes and they came home to an emotional wreck. So they were tired. He let them stay. And they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David and gave him bread and he did eat. And they made him drink water and they gave him a piece of a cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit came again to him for he had eaten no bread nor drunk any water three days and three nights. David said unto him, to whom belong you? And whence art thou? And he said, I'm a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite. And my master left me because three days agone, I fell sick. And he made an invasion upon the south of the Sherathites and upon the coast, which is, belongs to Judah, and upon the south of Caleb, and we burned the Ziklag with fire. So these a raiding band, like the Apaches, you know, came through the, the country and just raided Judah's, Judah land and some Cherethites land along the coast, and now they're heading home. David said unto him, can you bring me down to this company? He said, swear unto me by God that thou will neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will bring thee down to this company. Isn't that neat? He was a slave. He was captured out of Egypt and had to serve this Amalekite. He didn't like it. He said, yeah, I'll, I'll betray him if as long as I don't have to go to work for him again. 16, and when he had brought him down, behold, they were spread above abroad upon all the earth, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil that they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and out of the land of Judah. They were happy. They had a lot of stuff. And David smote them from twilight even unto the evening of the next day. And there escaped not a man of them, save 400 young men which rode upon camels and fled. There must have been a lot of guys because they only had 400 and they let 400 get away. So there was a lot of death there. Verse 18, David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. And David rescued <coughs> his two wives. That was a happy time, I'm sure. Very happy. And there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil nor anything that they had taken to them. David recovered all. David took all the flocks and the herds, which they drave before those other cattle and said, this is David's spoil. So all the Amalekites had, he got that too. This, this is mine now. That's a happy day. <clears throat> David came to the 200 men, which were so faint, they could not follow David, whom they had made also to abide at the brook Bezor. And they went forth to meet David and to meet the people that were with him. And when David came near to the people, he saluted them. <clears throat> then answered all the wicked men and men of Belial, of those that went with David, and said, because they went not with us, we will not give them aught, nothing of the spoil that we have recovered, save to every man his wife and his children, that they may lead them away and depart. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then said David, you shall not do so, my brethren, with that which the Lord hath given us, who hath preserved us and delivered the company that came against us into our hand. Again, this is why David was such a great guy with God. <clears throat> Sons of Belial said, that's not fair to give these guys. They didn't do the work. David said, shut up. God is to be praised. He gave us the victory and they're our guide. So we'll take care of it. 24, for who will hearken unto you in this matter? But as his part is that goes down to the battle, so shall his part be that tarries by the stuff. They shall take part alike. And it was so from that day forward <coughs> that he made it a statute and an ordinance for Israel unto this day. Share and share alike, everybody. And when David came to Ziklag, he sent of the spoil unto the elders of Judah, even to his friends, saying, Behold, a present for you of the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. And to them which were in Bethel, and to them which were in South Ramoth, and to them which were in Jatir, and to them which were in Aror, <coughs> and to them which were in Sifmoth, 
and to them which were in Eshtuma. Yeah, that's a funny name. And to them which were in Rachel, Rachel, and to them which were in the cities of the Jeremiahites, and to them which were in the cities of the Kenites. And to them which were in Hormath, and to them which were in Kor Ashan, and to them which were in Athak, and to them which were in Hebrew, Hebron, and to all the places where David himself and his men were wont to haunt. So these were places where the, the bad guys had raided. They took all their stuff and David gave it all back. The spoil, all the stuff. When I was a kid here at Spokane High School, we used to like to go to Seattle to thrift shops. And we had certain things that we always looked for, like real Texas cowboy shirts with rhinestone snaps. Mm -hmm. And we would go through the racks. I think Jesse inherited this from me. But we'd go through the racks, and after a while, you could identify th those shirts just by feel. You know, but real rhinestone snaps, three on the cuff, one mid, uh, Tex brand. And there were other, the other thing we'd look for, too, is navy wool pants, 13 button, which the buttons go like this in the front. Remember those? So that was just a thing. And we'd go, you know, when there were a concert or whatever, we'd hit the thrift shops, and we'd look for that. And we'd find one, and it was that same rush of finding great spoil. <laughs> you know the feeling. Uh Nowadays, in property management, I go into houses and they and I, I have to clean them up and get them ready for the next new tenants. So I have to make repairs and stuff, but they leave things behind. And one of the things that I've left behind lately is gallon jugs of insecticide. Home defense, which is very safe, very fair. I should have brought some for you today. I have like six gallons of oh home gosh. defense. So I'll go through the house and have a gallon. Home defense. You just spray it along the perimeter of your house and keeps the spiders out. So, wow, that's pretty cool. And sometimes I'll find, you know, other things. I think some of you kids you might think the same about Easter eggs. You know, here you are, you're holding this empty basket, and dad and mom says, Go. And you go out, and what do you do? You find this stuff, and it makes you happy. You know, it's the stuff, it's the spoil. In Psalm 119, this is how this whole thing started, because I was reading it the other morning. Psalm 119 and verse 162 says, I rejoiced at thy word as one that finds great spoil. You know, that excitement and the happiness of finding, wow, gold, silver, Easter eggs, rhinestone snap cowboy shirts, great spoil. And what is, I rejoice at thy word, at thy word. And that is something to keep in mind, you know, where would you be without his word? I think in the epistles it says, without hope, without God and without hope, just where would you be? And so to, to be able to hear his word and to read his word is a great, great excitement. There's a couple of verses before we close. Psalm 18. Psalm 18. Go back a few. Psalm 18, verse 30. We'll go through these pretty quick. Psalm 18, 30. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. You remember what a buckler was? It was kind of a shield, but it might have had some offensive spikes in it or something like that. Somebody tries to get you and they hit that and they hurt themselves. God is a buckler to them that trust in him. Psalm 56. Psalm 56 and in verse 4. Psalm 56, verse 4. In God, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. And in verse 10, same chapter. 
In God will I praise his word. In the Lord will I praise his word. There's no other way to get to know God except his word. That's what he's chosen. Psalm 103. In Psalm 103, verse 19. <coughs> Psalm 103, 19. The Lord has prepared his throne in the heavens. And his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, ye his angels or ministers that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. And go over a couple of pages to Psalm 107 and in verse 20. Psalm 107, 20. He sent his word. And what? Healed them. Healed them and delivered them from their destructions. That's what his word does. Sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. And Psalm 138, <coughs> verse 2. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. You know, above everything God made, formed, and created, he's magnified his word. That's how you get to know him. There was one in Proverbs 30. Oh, Proverbs 30 and number 5, verse 5. Yeah. Proverbs 30, verse 5. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. So, I rejoice that thy word is one that finds great spoil. Great treasure. Great stuff that's exciting and makes you happy. And to conclude, we're going to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, and this is what it says in verse 12 in King James. You know this by heart. Hebrews 4, 12, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. <coughs> From the working translation, same verse. 12 and 13, certainly the word of God is living and powerfully active and sharper than every double-edged sword, even penetrating to the dividing between soul and spirit and also between joints and marrow and is able to judge between the thoughts and intentions of the heart. 13, and no created being is hidden in his sight. Everything is naked and exposed in the eyes of him with whom we have our account. That's a, <coughs> in other words, the word of God is sharp. I think about that. I thought about that in David. Here the sons of Belial said, you know, logically, the guys who did the work should get the reward. These guys stayed by the brook. They shouldn't get the reward. But God separated the thoughts and intents of the heart. Those guys were evil. Those were sons of Belial. In spite of the fact it looked good politically and logically, God said, no, everybody shares because we're family. We love one. The whole thing's based on love. That's how sharp that word was, separated that. <coughs> so, spoil. You know, you may not be in a position where you find stuff or are into snap button Texas shirts, but this word is worth rejoicing on it's great it's spoiled and it has something to say to you today and every day so thanks we'll pray <clears throat> thanks father for your word how wonderful it is and for us to be able to look at it and get our minds and thoughts into it to see what's right and what's wrong what's good and what's best for us to be able to Rightly divide it like that is certainly a privilege. Not that we do it all the time, but once in a while we, we luck out.
Thanks, Father, for your watching over us for our day today and for believers everywhere that they're enjoying themselves, enjoying the deliverance and health that only you can provide and the hope for a wonderful, wonderful future coming any day now. Thank you, Father, for your goodness once again, your kindness and for your forgiveness. And we pray for a great day and week going forward in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 We'll probably meet in 15 or so.